Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm uh, Sandra Hernandez, and I'm the CEO at the California Healthcare Foundation, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome everybody who was able to join us today uh, for this uh, report on ATLAS that uh, IHA did in conjunction with the uh, California Health Department. I want to welcome those of you who are on the phone and those of you that are joining us via the web. Uh, I think we have a really interesting conversation today where we have a chance uh, to really look at the state of California from the point of view of both quality and cost, looking at geographies, looking at product types, all in the spirit of trying to figure out how to make healthcare work better for all Californians, something that the California Healthcare Foundation, of course, is uh, deeply committed to. And this kind of data and information and the tool that has been built here and for which we will be able to build in the future, we think is quite integral to actually taking opportunities to improve both quality and costs. Um, I, um, I uh, want to note that this has been a project long time in coming. <laughs> I uh, will look at uh, Dolores and our colleagues and partners from IHA. Uh, took an extraordinary partnership from many partners to collect all of that information, to aggregate it, to understand how uh, to put it together. And of course, in the spirit of, again, trying to build on it and ultimately, uh, I think, trying to improve it. Uh, this atlas, of course, happened pre-ACA. It does represent a point in time, an important point of time from a baseline perspective, but one in which we are really committed to trying to understand what are the implications throughout the state of California as we look at both of those indicators. Uh, so I want to thank all of our partners. I'll also acknowledge that uh, Secretary Dooley is very interested in this kind of data. Uh, we've had numerous conversations about that. She is unable to be with us today. Um, but she did today uh, do a little video to uh, make a few remarks, and so I want to turn it over to that, and then I'm going to give it over to Katie, <laughs> and uh, Katie will step in in that capacity. And again, thank you to all of our partners who allowed us to do this. We hope it generates interesting questions. Uh, we hope it, uh, more importantly, really inspires us to think about how we continue on this journey to improve quality while reducing costs, something that I think everybody in the room understands, whether you're in policy or whether you're in plans or whether you're providers, is an important journey for all of us to be on. So welcome to all of you, and I believe Secretary Dooley is right here. Oh, there is an evaluation in your packet. Uh, CHCF does use these to think about next programs and next bodies of work, and so at the end of the meeting, a very short survey we'd ask you to, uh, to fill out. Thank you, and Secretary Dooley. I'm Diana Dooley, Secretary of the California Health and Human Services Agency. Thank you for attending this important briefing on the cost and quality of California healthcare. While I'm disappointed that I can't be there in person, I'm glad I can share some insights with you about the importance of this groundbreaking project. As you probably know, in California and the nation, indicators of healthcare quality and cost vary dramatically. This has been true for decades. While some variation is explained by patient differences, such as health status, other variation is unexplained and potentially unwarranted. In 2012, I convened the Let's Get Healthy California Task Force with the ambitious goal of becoming the healthiest state in the nation within a decade by advancing the triple aim of better health, better care, and lower cost and promoting health e equity. We furthered this effort with two grants from the Federal Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. As part of that work, the California Regional Health Care Cost and Quality Atlas represents an exciting step forward in understanding how quality and cost vary regionally across California. Developed by the Integrated Healthcare Association in partnership with the California Healthcare Foundation and the California Health and Human Services Agency, the ATLAS can both help us identify and understand differences across the state and set a benchmark to track our progress in improving care for Californians. If we can learn from high-performing areas and providers that deliver higher quality, lower cost care, we can transform patient care, improve quality, and potentially save Californians 
billions of dollars. I don't want to scoop what's coming next, so I'll close by saying that we at the California Health and Human Services Agency welcome this work, and we are excited to be a part of this ongoing project. So thank you. Um, I'm Katie Hydorn with the Health and Human Services Agency here in person on behalf of Secretary <laughs> Dooley. Um, I do think she said it all. We are so excited to be a part of this effort. We are ever grateful to our partners over the last several years at the California Health Care Foundation um, for their ongoing support um, and direct engagement in this project. And of course, the expertise of IHA, who have just been fantastic partners. Um, and we can't wait for Cost Atlas 2.0. Um, so we'll have our 2013 data, and then we'll have our 2015 data. So we get our pre and post ACA look. Um, we're just so excited you're all here with us. Um, I think we see this as a first step in looking at cost and quality transparency across California. Um, and we cannot wait to see what you all do with these results. So um, we're standing by not only continuing to crunch numbers, but also really excited about um, hopefully all the questions and efforts that come out of this um, now that you have the data in your hands. So thank you and turn it over to Dolores. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dolores Yanagihara with Integrated Healthcare Association. And I am thrilled to be here and have results to share with you today. Um, uh, this has been a long time in coming. Um, there's been reference to that. This has been a two-year project um, filled with legal agreements and um, data and resubmissions of data and resubmissions of data and data standardization and aggregation and um, doing calculations and then reworking. And so it's been a, it's a, been a long journey, but um, it's great to be at this point um, and share with you today some of the products that came out of this project as well as the results. So this project really is not about provider measurement or health plan measurement. It's all about geographic level measurement um, by pair and product type. And so really trying to understand what's happening regionally and then what's happening with different populations within the region. Um, you know, we couldn't have done this without our great collaborators, um, the CHCF and, and the agency, and we're, we're just grateful. Um, they provided so much guidance along the way and support. Um, and we couldn't have done this without our data partners, um, all of the health plans that contributed data. Um, the Department of Healthcare Services provided all the Medi-Cal results, and Truven Health Analytics, who is our um, data aggregation partner. Uh, so we really hope that this data will be able to highlight um, some opportunities for improvement, um, some areas where um, some targeted efforts could really help, um, and also provide a baseline. Um, we don't see this as a, as a one-time deal. Um, we hope that this can be, at least we'll have a round two, and we hope that this can be an ongoing type of project so we can really monitor what's going on. We selected a, a small but hopefully um, representative and important measure set um, to start with. Uh, so these are the clinical quality measures. There are six HEDIS measures that um, span prevention and chronic care. Um, and we also combine those together into composites so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on overall. Um, some common hospital utilization measures and a composite that brings all of those uh, utilization measures together, as well as total cost of care. And if you're familiar with the HEDIS by Geography project, the HEDIS by Geography focused on um, kind of just the first two areas, clinical quality and, and resource use. Um, this is adding in total cost of care, so we have a more comprehensive view of what's going on. <laughs> Uh, we looked at this regionally. Um, we decided to use the 19 covered California regions because that seemed to be a good number, um, granular enough, but not too granular. Um, they were already defined areas, and so um, that's, those are the regions that we used. You can see those definitions up here. Um, and again, we broke it down by payer and product type. And you can see um, we have pretty good coverage. About two-thirds of the state um, is covered by this work. And actually, a little more than that, um, you'll see here for Medicare fee-for-service, um, we did not, uh, we're not able to get member-level data for round one. So we actually do have some information on all of the Medicare fee-for-service members for hospital utilization, but we didn't count those members since we weren't able to do kind of an apples-to-apples -apples on all of the different uh, measures. Uh, but nonetheless, we have 100% uh, coverage on, on Medi-Cal and commercial HMO. 
um, and about 80% on Medicare Advantage, 50% on commercial PPO. So pretty, uh, pretty good coverage. One of the main products of this project um, is the Atlas. Um, it's an online interactive web tool that was designed to be able to do comparisons across measures and across products. Um, I'm not going to do a live demo, but I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the features. Um, I hope that you'll get on and play with it, and there's just so much information um, in there, and you can spend a lot of time just looking at different measures, product combinations, um, and really um, looking at the patterns and see, seeing what you um, can take away from it. And I would love to get your feedback as you're doing that on some of the, um, the uh, things that you've learned, some suggestions that you have to improve it, because we will be doing a round two and we'd love to be able to improve on the tool as we go forward. Um, there is a lot of information um, in the tool um, about the atlas, so uh, circled in yellow at the top, um, about the atlas, about the data, so if you want to understand more about the data and some of the caveats around exactly what the methodology is, that's all documented. Um, the issue brief, that was another product, um, as well as a fact sheet, are um, linked in there so that you can um, access them directly. And then there's a help page that kind of um, helps you walk through how to use um, this tool. Um, you'll see that um, there's one map showing right now. Um, actually, each measure and payer product type will be shown three ways. There's the map that you can visually see what's going on with the color coding. Um, the blue is better performance. The darker the blue, the better. <laughs> As it gets to the middle, it's more of the middle. And then the darker the red, the, the lower the performance or the worse the performance. Um, sometimes lower is better, sometimes higher is better. So I, I just kind of say better and worse instead of higher or lower because it can get a little confusing otherwise. Um, and then you can actually add other maps. Um, so you'll see here step one, select what kind of measure you want. Um, and then step two, selecting the, the um, payer type that you want to look at. Um, and then you, another, another map will appear um, where you can compare side by side. As well as the map, you have a data table, so you can actually see all the numbers um, that correspond with the measures you've selected for that payer and product type. And there's also a bar chart at the bottom that's a range from the worst performance to the best performance. So you can kind of see um, what that looks like and how much variation there is. Um, and you can also um, look at how that compares to both state and national benchmarks. So, uh, you know, hopefully one of these views will really resonate with you. Some people are data people, some people are more visual, and so we try to kind of get all different kinds of um, ways to, to see the data. Um, there's also the ability to um, download the data. Um, so if you want to uh, take this data and kind of play around with it and slice it and dice it and do your own graphing and things like that, you can download the data and do that. Um, you can also, if you find um, a particular view that you find very interesting or would like to share with others, you can hit the little share button and the URL for that specific view um, will, will pop up and you can copy and paste it and send it to people and when they click on it, it will take them directly to that view. So you don't have to say, go here, click this, select that, do that, it just takes them directly there. So that is the tool. Um, I'm now going to turn over to um, some of the results. And most of our results today will focus on the commercial insurance sector. Um, I will have a few um, Medi-Cal and Medicare results later, but um, we had kind of the most comprehensive data um, in, in the most timely way uh, for the commercial insurance, so we focused on that. And, and I'm going to start by looking at regional variation. So commercial HMO and PPO combined, um, but really looking at regional variation. And we see some very distinct patterns emerge. Um, we see that with the exception of Region 1, which is uh, the northern counties, um, all of northern California far outperforms um, central California and southern California, and is well above the statewide average. So the dark horizontal um, line is the statewide average across all of commercial. Um, and so you can see northern is, is above. Um, central is all below average. And then Southern California is above average, but not as above average as, um, as the northern regions. Now looking at cost, what does cost look like? Well, we see a little bit of the opposite um, on cost. 
So again, the, the dark horizontal bar is the statewide average um, for total cost of care. It's $4,300 per member per year on average. Um, that's kind of an, an, an all-in um, number. And uh, you see that Northern California is all above the statewide average in cost. So these have not been, these have been risk adjusted, but not geography adjusted. So the input costs in different geographies have not been taken into consideration. Um, Southern California, on the other hand, is um, all below average cost. And so you can see the, the green bars on the right are all um, below the, the statewide average. And then central is variable, kind of all over the place in terms of cost. So what does it look like when we bring it all together? Um, what you see is that all northern California regions fall into the higher quality, higher cost quadrant. We see that southern California falls into the higher quality, lower cost quadrant. And then we see Central California, quality-wise, is all below average, but cost is, again, spread all over the place. Um, and so uh, there are really, you see these very distinct um, differences. We also looked at hospital utilization to see if, if that um, you know, seemed to have a relationship um, with, with quality or cost. And um, we saw lots of variation in the hospital utilization, um, but no real geographic patterns that emerged from that. Um, you can see here the, um, the minimum region rate, the maximum region rate, and then the statewide average in the middle. So you see there's lots of variation um, across um, all of the, all three measures. But in particular, you see the emergency department visits, where the maximum region is more than double um, the, the minimum uh, region. So lots of geographic variation um, and uh, not necessarily correlated uh, in terms of looking at the cost. So we're going to look at that in a little more detail in a minute. So now let's turn, that was kind of looking at geographic variation. Now let's look at within the commercial uh, insurance uh, the HMO products versus the PPO products. And let's see what we find on um, the different product types. So again, this is um, clinical quality. The horizontal um, dark line is the statewide average. And what we see here is that all of the commercial HMO is well above average, um, far outperforms the commercial PPO. So all of the blue triangles are HMO. The orange circles are PPO. And so um, across all of the regions, with the exception of region 13, um, which is the eastern regions, um, we see that the, the HMO is far uh, superior to the PPO in terms of clinical quality. And just to give you some, some context, um, the gap in California is actually larger than the gap nationally. So the HMOs in California are actually above the national average whereas the PPOs are at, in California are actually below the national average. And so there's a difference nationally um, with HMO being better than PPO, but in California, it's an even bigger difference. Now, what about cost? You might think, you know, higher quality, higher cost, um, but that is not what we see. Um, this time, the kind of the zero mark is a, the vertical line from which the the horizontal lines are, are protruding. Um, and when it's a blue line, that means the HMO is costlier. And so you see there are a few regions where HMO is costlier. Um, but all of the orange lines are where PPO are costlier than HMO. And so for 12 of the regions, you see that PPO, commercial PPO, is costlier than commercial HMO. Um, the largest difference is in San Mateo County, where PPO is $1,200 per member per year more um, than commercial HMO. Um, there are a couple of regions, um, Los Angeles East and um, Orange County, where the costs are about the same for both HMO and PPO. So when you bring that together, looking at quality, looking at cost, we see that in the upper left quadrant, which is the higher quality, lower cost quadrant, which is 
where you want to be. You want to maximize your quality and at, you know, at the lowest cost possible. Um, all of those are um, the HMO product. Okay? Now, there are, granted, um, many HMOs that are in the higher quality, higher cost quadrant as well. Um, but there are no PPOs in the higher quality, lower cost quadrant. And vice versa, the place you really don't want to be um, is the lower quality, higher cost quadrant down in the bottom right. And down there, you see only the PPO. So a pretty um, stark difference. Now, you would think PPO is costlier, so PPO must have more hospital utilization, right? You'd think that hospital utilization might be driving um, the, the costs. But what we find is actually, if anything, PPO does better on utilization. They have lower utilization than HMO. Um, and so you see the admission, readmission rate is pretty much the same. Um, inpatient bed days, HMO is slightly more, but pretty much the same. But the biggest difference here is on emergency department visits, um, where the um, HMO used considerably more emergency department visits than PPO. So um, it does not appear that hospital utilization is driving the higher PPO costs because the PPO is, has less hospital utilization. So if cost is a kind of a combination of unit price and utilization, if it's not utilization, at least based on hospital utilization, then it suggests that perhaps the cost differences is really due to unit price differences. Um, what you see, if, you, uh, if hospital utilization were correlated to cost, you would expect to see kind of all the dots going from the lower co cost, lower um, utilization <coughs> quadrant down to the higher cost, higher utilization um, quadrant. So that's what you'd expect if they were related. But you actually see the opposite. Um, so you see that higher cost regions have lower utilization and lower cost regions have higher utilization. And so again, this, these results really point toward um, unit price um, driving the cost differences. Now, again, we only have three hospital utilization measures, so that's not all the utilization measures possible. Um, but uh, for at least the measures that we have, this is what it's suggesting. All right, so that was commercial, uh, commercial geographic variation, commercial HMO versus commercial PPO. Um, now let's take a look at some Medi-Cal results. So this first slide is um, Medi-Cal managed care. And what we see is that there is a lot of, of variation um, in Medi-Cal managed care. So the top two measures are two of the clinical quality measures. Um, then there's three of the hospital utilization measures. And then um, the observed total cost of care measure. Um, you can see that the best performing region, the statewide average, and then the worst performing region. Um, and what you notice is that um, in the best performers, there's Northern California, Southern California, Central California. In the worst performers, you see Northern California, Southern California, Central California. So there are really no clear geographic patterns that come out um, in terms of uh, the managed care performance. But the one thing you do see is across every measure, lots of variation between the lowest and highest performers. Now, let's take a look at Medi-Cal managed care versus Medi-Cal fee-for-service. And I would just note um, that in these measures, for example, in the um, clinical quality measures, we only include those that have uh, full scope benefits. Um, so they would have benefits for these services. Um, and what we see here is that um, for clinical quality, managed care um, outperforms fee-for-service. Um, on the hospital utilization, it's kind of mixed. Um, we see that um, managed care actually uses more ED visits, just like we saw in commercial with the HMO using more ED visits than the, um, the PPO, similar here. Um, but on bed days, um, fee-for-service uses many more bed days. Um, part of that could be for this, th these measures, um, we did include those who have uh, just a, a limited scope, which would be more hospital-focused benefits. Uh, and so it could make sense that, that on a per thousand member year basis, there would be more hospitalization because some of the people in that population only had um, hospital benefits. 
Um, and then with the total cost of care, we see that managed care is, is costlier than um, fee-for-service. Just a quick look at Medicare. Um, we do not have um, Medicare fee-for-service clinical results because we weren't able to get the member level Medicare fee-for-service data for round one. Um, we are, are expecting to get that for round two. So we'll be able to replace that question mark and we'll know what the clinical quality looks like. Um, what we do know about Medicare Advantage though is that it is actually the best performance in the state, even better than commercial HMO. Uh, across all of the measures that apply to, to Medicare. So Medicare Advantage is doing great on clinical quality. Uh, in terms of um, the hospital utilization, uh, one caveat, uh, because we don't have the member level data, we don't have an exactly the same methodology for measuring utilization, um, but we have very similar measures. Um, and the differences are so striking that even if some of the difference is due to methodology, there still truly must be um, a difference because we see that there's a 50 to 75% higher utilization rate in Medicare fee-for-service than Medicare Advantage. Um, but on cost, almost the same. So even though utilization um, for, of hospital services is much higher for fee-for-service, that doesn't translate into necessarily higher costs on a per member per year basis. Again, pointing toward really unit price and not utilization um, driving the differences in cost. So that was a quick um, summary of uh, the results from, <laughs> I know I threw a lot at you right then. <laughs> um, it, there's all of this and more um, is in the, the issue brief. Um, and so there's 16 pages of all kinds of good stuff and a little bit more um, explanations and things like that. So please um, hope that you will take the time to, to read the issue brief and dig into it a little bit more. Um, that was round one. As we've mentioned, we're already starting to work on round two. Uh, and uh, round two will be hopefully bigger and better. Uh, we will be expanding um, all of the different types of measures um, and have more measures. So it'll be even uh, a broader range of performance that we can measure. Um, we also will be um, having more members. So as Medi-Cal has expanded, um, we'll be getting the Medicare fee-for-service data. We're hoping that we can work with the, the plans um, on the PPO side to get more of the self-insured because that is a, a kind of a gap right now. Um, and so uh, hopefully we'll have an even more um, comprehensive view for round two, which should be released um, less than a year from now. And that'll focus on 2015 data, so we'll have that pre-ACA, ACA, post-ACA view. So at this point, I am going to hand it over to Jeff um, to bring up the panel, and we'll have a panel discussion, and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, okay, so we're going to break now into a panel, and um, Hopefully this is where the convention doesn't go off the rails, but uh, we'll see how that goes. So um, we'll do about uh, 15, 20 minutes on the panel, and I'll introduce the panelists. Please sit down if you would. And then um, we have a very generous Q&A period, including, I, I believe, the folks on the webinar as well. Can they send in um, questions, I, I believe? And then um, one thing uh, we'd like to do is also have uh, both the Department of uh, Managed Health Care and the DOI offer a comment uh, after that period. And or before the Q and A, and then finally we'll do a, a, a voice a voice roll call vote. Uh, <laughs> we have time. So, anyway, um, first and foremost, I think uh, really uh, I personally want to thank Dolores uh, for all of her hard work. She's been at this literally for years, and I joined IHA a little over a year ago. So I am truly inheriting uh, the effort of, of Dolores and many others for many years, and I think. Um, it's important to recognize the contribution that our plan partners made as well. Uh, this is their data uh, that we are working with, um, and I really want to thank them for that. And also a shout out to Truven, because a lot of the work here uh, really goes to the analytics and the quality of the work product under um, extremely uh, challenging conditions oftentimes. So with that, I will turn to our panel. So um, what we tried to do was bring together uh, a number of uh, different voices. Um, that could have different views uh, on this information. And as you can tell, even from this 
uh, very quick uh, drive-by on the information. There's a lot here. Uh, one result that I'd say personally, there are some striking findings, at least in my opinion, um, and that wasn't necessarily where we thought we'd end up. So there is actually a lot that people can look at and take away from this. Um, so what we'll do is I will go through the panel, they'll each get a question, and then we'll, if we have time to get a second question, and then we'll see where we are at that. So um, uh, our first uh, panelist, Kristen Miranda from Blue Shield of California is there. Um, next, uh, Don Crane, the CEO of CAPG, uh, representing providers. Um, a purchaser perspective from Sarah Flox as well. Um, who is from the California Federation of Labor, and a consumer perspective from Beth Capel from Health Access. So we will go from here. So I'm gonna put on my glasses. <laughs> and I do need them, believe me. Um, so I'm gonna start with Kristen. Um, Kristen, there's a lot of research highlighting regional cost and quality differences, particularly in Medicare, especially the Dartmouth Atlas. Um, this goes along those lines and shows some similar wide cost and quality variations now for commercially insured enrollees. Uh, what do you take away from this and, and what caveats potentially do we need to think about as we look at this information? So I'm going to actually start just by sort of congratulating your three organizations. This is remarkable. <laughs> I mean, this is truly remarkable, I think, what you've done. And I think it's a great model for, frankly, a lot of other places in the country. So it's going to be, I think, incredible to kind of dig into this. And you all have seen now these results are striking. And they're also kind of all over the map, right, depending on how you want to look at the data. So I think what I would say, just high-level takeaways, no surprise to us that there's a significant difference between the North and the South. I think we can maybe touch on that a little bit more in detail um, later. I think the other thing that this shows is what I think most of us who've been doing this for a long time have believed, and that is, I think this is certainly some supporting evidence that the integrated model is really driving some value out there. And then I guess for me, I think the third takeaway is you cannot hide <laughs> anymore in healthcare, nor should we be able to. We need to get ready for greater and greater transparency. And that is across all the stakeholders, certainly the providers, the health plans, the, the, um, the pharmacy um, uh, organizations. I think we've all got to get ready to make sure that we are getting out there in the marketplace um, open and clear information about the kind of value that we're each driving or not. Thank you. So Beth, I'm going to ask you um, and some of these questions you'll see have a little bit of an um, ed editorial spin on them, uh, <laughs> which with Beth can handle, I'm sure. Um, so what do these findings mean for consumers, especially since many people are limited in how far they can go or are willing to go to get care? There's limited access to integrated care options, uh, particularly on the exchange, and given PPO networks have become more restrictive since the pre-ACA view of performance. Uh, Thank you, Jeff. Well, let me start off by saying um, that one of the pleasures of being a panelist on a panel like this is you get a preview. And so it's been great fun to look at the data, and I would encourage everybody who is interested enough to pay attention to so spend some time playing with the data, because it will reward your attention. Um, a couple of things, and um, for an individual consumer, the idea that I should move from San Francisco to San Bernardino in order to get lower cost, higher quality care <laughs> is probably not going to cross my mind. Um, we look forward to a day when we actually have um, comparison data plan by plan, product by product on the regional level rather than this aggregated data. So we think from um, as much fun as it is from an advocacy perspective and from a policymaker perspective, this particular data is not particularly actionable by individual consumers. We're also struck in looking at your quality measures by the pre and also the Medi-Cal Medi results by how different the pre-ACA world, wa world was. Despite um, our insurance commissioner, both the current one, Dave Jones, and his predecessor, John Garamendi, really trying to assure that there were comprehensive benefits. The PPOs that were licensed by CDI pre-ACA were not required to cover doctor visits, yet every one of the quality measures that you've used is dependent on, um, is dependent on coverage of doctor visits. The second thing we're struck by is that um, 
there, you control for a number of things, but it's a multivariate world. And controlling for actuarial value also will affect the difference between PPOs and HMOs. Consumers avoid getting necessary care when they face very high out-of-pocket costs. To the extent that PPOs tend to have higher deductibles than HMOs, this, that's part of what you're picking up. So it's both the difference in the covered benefits and the difference in the cost sharing. And that, that then informs some of the regional differences you find. So the three outlier regions, the eastern counties, Imperial, Inyo, so on, the northern counties, the counties north of here, and the central coast are all counties where PPOs are dominant. And so it is, um, there's a whole nother layer of analysis that I encourage you to look at and that I would encourage folks to have in mind as they look at these um, results. Thanks, Beth. Just a, um, a, a question for that, though. Do you think, um, and I'm going off script now, uh, <laughs> do you think this uh, mitigates the findings significantly, or does it just inform us uh, about where we need to go to put a finer point on those findings? Well, uh, you know, one of the things you did do in the research brief was to back out Kaiser Permanente to see if that was part of what was um, affecting your findings. I would really encourage that the CDI PPO lives, that you take a look at backing them out and see if it affects the findings on the HMO versus PPO, because I suspect it would. And similarly, the dominance of PPOs in those, re in, especially in those particularly rural regions will also affect the findings. It doesn't invalidate them, it just informs them. If, they, if, it's, if you're measuring quality based on something that's not a covered benefit, or where consumers face very substantial cost sharing to take advantage of the benefit, it will change the results. Great. Okay, next question for Don. Um, the consistency and magnitude of the findings specific to HMO versus PPO value seem to be significant, noting HMO products tend to be supported by integrated <coughs> delivery systems, while PPO products are not. Um, what's your key takeaway when you see this kind of information? So the first thing I do very quickly, I won't repeat everything Kristen said, but I want to echo her comments in terms of what a tour de force this is. Um, we have never really had this kind of side-by-side -side comparison historically. So the IHA and its partners have done a remarkable job in the past in terms of the paper performance program, and we've had a good view into the California uh, HMO product, but without any kind of corresponding view into the PPO world. And now we get that, the two juxtaposed and mixed in, of course, with the other products and payers. So it's a far richer view, more actionable. Um, the days arrive with, the, with this transparency. We can now really do things with it in terms of a from policy standpoint. So anyway, um, very much thank you and congratulations. I think the key takeaway is I think you used the word striking, and I think that uh, Dolores used the word stark. The difference in quality, HMO to PPO, is shocking. It's dramatic. Across five of the six measures, HMO isn't just a little higher quality. It's a whole lot higher quality. And then in about one of the six, it's very close. So that just jumps out. And then when you add that to the results in terms of total cost of care, which is a very interesting metric we now have, uh, much could be said about, I mean, you just see higher quality, lower cost. And while there are other factors at play, social determinants, socioeconomic status, clearly you see that here as we look at you know the North and Central Valley and Inland Empire and so on. Still in all, this remarkable differential between PPO and HMO, which by the way are just proxy words for integrated versus sort of not integrated delivery systems. And I think we all sort of understand that. But that information should, I think, drive policy changes, okay? Legislative, regulatory, and then purchaser habits. I mean, it's almost to a kind of an ethical question now as to whether CalPERS and the exchange and other large purchasers need to think about what they're furnishing their employees in open enrollment. I think they used to, in a rather cavalier way, say, hey, everything's available, free choice, and what do we care? But when you see this kind of value differential, particularly in quality, I think it raises a, almost an ethical question. Um, so I think that actually is the key takeaway. We first time we've ever seen such a stark difference between delivery systems. It's the model here that's making all the difference. If we could move the model up into MODOC, we'd get better results. So it's the model that counts. I think that's the key. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Don. Uh, next question for Sarah. Um, Beth alluded to the cost sharing, and again, for the audience, um, Dolores mentioned this, but the patient uh, costs were included in total cost of care. There's a calculation for that. So, um, so if significant patient cost sharing, both in the form of deductibles and coinsurance, makes PPOs more costly for enrollees, what challenges does that generate for you in your role as a purchaser? Well, as the California Labor Federation representing unions, we both purchase coverage for our members, but we also negotiate for that coverage. And for us, the higher the cost sharing, deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance for our members, means that we're limiting access to care. And so that, we think, affects the quality of the care that they're gonna get. If you can't get a doctor visit, if you can't afford any of the treatments you're prescribed, then that's not high quality care. And so this makes a big difference in looking at how we're gonna make purchasing decisions. We're always trying to protect our members from having high out of pocket, especially when we represent low income members in many sectors of the economy. We have to make sure they have access to care. Um, but what I think, actually what you said just kind of struck me is what is the imperative in terms of advocacy? What's most striking to me really were the regional differences. Um, just because, like Beth said, or maybe you said, we can't move from Northern California to Southern <laughs> California. That's just, we can move from PPO to HMO, but we, we really can't move geographically. And to me, it was so striking, the cost differences, that it really, it makes me want to take off my purchaser hat, put on an advocacy hat, that we need to do something about this. Um, and really look into what we call at least the Sutter effect of what's happening in Northern and California, and is that really driving up costs across the board? whether it's um, HMOs or, or PPOs. So for, for me, that was a really striking finding. And this really opened up more questions than not. So I'm looking so forward to 2.0, especially the self-insured data. OK, our first rumblings on the convention floor there. <laughs> <laughs> well <done. laughs> I'm going to uh, switch the order a little bit um, and go back to Don. Um, Don, ACOs and other forms of integrated care are starting to be available through PPOs. And they're often cited as a possible solution to this type of performance difference. Um, do you or CAPG have an opinion on how well ACOs are working and whether they can match the performance of successful integrated care delivery models in the HMO? And Kristen, since you're so involved in that as well, I'd, I'd love to have your comments too. So we do. And I mean, in a word, ACOs are struggling. Now, it's important here to define what we're talking about. So Medicare ACOs, we are observing uh, challenged by what we would regard as a somewhat flawed model, fee-for-service platform, open network. These issues have, I think, prevented the Medicare ACOs from flourishing to the extent that we hope they do. Changes, I think, are in the offing in the future. Looking at the kind of commercial ACOs, big distinction between those that are built on a PPO platform and those built on an HMO platform, the latter of which Kristen knows a whole lot about, those ACOs in California built on a PPO platform are likewise struggling. It's good. Directionally, we're working on it. The plans and the groups are making big, big strides in terms of sharing data and um, making improvements there. But in a word, that whole product line lacks the word product. So people buying PPO don't know that they're buying a PPO ACO. Were they to do so, they would effectively be assigning themselves, enrolling themselves into a product and hopefully engaging in it. That's not the current sort of state of the art right now. And so the, most of the PPO ACOs, not all of them, I'm generalizing, but most of them are struggling. Um, we conducted some surveys with our members on it. So there's some improvement that needs to be done there. Um, my understanding is the, the, the ACOs built on a HMO platform are, however, many of them doing quite well. I'll really turn to Kristen there, and particularly that's Blue Shield. But we've got some dramatically excellent results there, but a very different kind of model and grounded basically in the HMO with, I think, a lot of new uh, bells and whistles that make it better. So, Kristen, can you pick up from there? And also, um, we've, we've noted that what some are calling the Kaiser effect in this information. Um, if you, if you we have the Sutter effect and we have the Kaiser effect. Yeah. And yeah. They're so, both powerful, for yes. sure. So if you want to pick it up from there. Sure. Actually, so I want to just touch on, though, I, I do think what we're continuing to kind of see is 
the, the work that we've been doing with some of our, what we're calling our ACO partners, we really weren't calling it that before the passage of um, the ACA. We started this work a long time ago. It has been remarkable to see that even in an environment and working with organizations that have been doing sort of integrated, delegated care for decades, there has been significant opportunity to make further inroads. I think Don's exactly right. When you look at taking that model, that more integrated model, and try to turn it on to a PPO sort of chassis, it's wildly problematic. And I think that's why we didn't start there. We're going there now because the market is sort of demanding that. But I do think that those kinds of programs absolutely have to be coupled with benefit designs that link a patient to a primary care physician that allow for some higher degree of choice than what you might see in an HMO platform. But we've really got to be moving in that direction where it's not just a cost issue, it is absolutely a quality issue. We started um, on the exchange with a PPO program for a variety of reasons that made a whole heck of a lot of sense at the time. We, like all kinds of organizations across the country, are really struggling now with that population, and we are committed to staying in. Many have gotten out. We are fully committed to staying in, but we are now introducing in 2017 a, uh, an HMO-based product that really is targeted around our key partners that are just clearly driving superior value. So in another comment along the way, some other public work that IHA does is to uh, look at the performance of over 200 uh, risk-bearing physician organizations. And um, it's clear that there is a distribution of performance on both quality and cost. Um, it's also clear that most of them seem to do pretty well when you start to compare them straight across to the PPO performance, too. So those kinds of thoughts and analyses are now something that we can do or other people can do with the information. Um, so, Sarah, I'm going to come back to you. Um, so what's going to change in your decisions now as a purchaser based either on what you've seen or what people are saying? Are you going to flood everybody into the HMO again? Or what, what's going to happen? Um, well, we're kind of like a cruise ship. We don't move that quickly. Um, Hopefully not an Italian <laughs> cruise ship, right? I, I think for purchasing decisions, we would need much more granular information um, on really looking within a region, what are the, act, the differences between, even within an HMO, between quality. But I think just culturally, as purchasers, um, it's very useful to just again and again and again see the connection between quality and cost. So really emphasizing the value proposition. I think we've come from a little bit of a world where in negotiating benefits, you wanted to make sure that we got the best benefits for our members where they paid the least out of pocket. Now there's the whole added issue of quality. We want to make sure that they are not paying that much out of their pocket, but they're getting very high quality care, in part because that helps contain costs. And so that's a little bit of a cultural shift for us as purchasers. And so I think things like this, a really great integrative or interactive map, is wonderful for us to take back and to be able to start really emphasizing this. And so um, I think it will help in, in cultural shifts that will lead to uh, hopefully purchasing shifts. Great. And I've been waiting for this for years. I'm going to give Beth the, the last word. Um, um, but before we do that, I just want to say um, um, I've asked if the panelists can stay up for our Q&A period, too. And I'll be kind of directing the questions, but uh, we'll ask them to do that. So. Beth, in addition to the comment you're about to make, um, what's your impression of this as pre-ACA information versus what it could mean with a even more robust and larger 2015 data set that's post-ACA? Well, once we have the post-ACA information, then we will actually have a fair comparison of PPOs and HMOs. We will not simply be comparing um, products that required coverage of medically necessary care with products that did not. And so there were many hundreds of thousands of lives, unfortunately, at, in CDI PPOs where doctor visits were not, where only one or two doctor visits were covered. And so, so let me, let me, let me so but I'll so put you on the spot. What do you, what do you think will change in the results? I don't, we don't know until we see them. I was them. trying to get a prediction there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and 
we hope that when we see the next set of results that you'll control for actuarial value mm -hmm. so that we know it's not that you're comparing apples to apples and not half apples to half apples. Um, half, half what? A half an apple to, half a, an apple. to an entire <laughs> apple. Or a part of an apple to an entire apple. Okay. I think the other thing, I mean, part of what's fun and important about this kind of information is that as we move forward to a healthcare system that should be not just higher quality and lower cost, but more efficient, more effective at delivering the care people need, safer, and that improves equity rather than inadvertently undermining it, which I think is the other variable that we need to always have in mind that these kinds of comparisons are very important. The frame of you should be in the quadrant that's high quality, lower cost um, is an important frame. And whatever our hesitations about the current data, that's they're in the spirit of moving forward to better, better information and better thinking about the system. OK, so I promised Beth I'd give her the last word. So I'm going to make one comment, but allow her to respond to it. Um, so, uh, as we've alluded to in all seriousness, this has been a sprint to get to these results. And even as, as, even as recently as this morning, we were checking back with some of this PPO data. Just so you know, um, more than half of it, almost two thirds of it, came from plans that were DMHC regulated, which theoretically have the preventive coverage. And the uh, plans that were not uh, regulated by the DMHC but were regulated by the DOI, I believe we found out this morning they, they all had preventive benefits. Yeah, I confirmed benefits. it was full, full coverage even in 2013. So, yeah. so, again, Beth, you can have the last word. <laughs> she said, fair enough, I heard her. Well, we're still, but you're still not controlling for the difference in cost sharing. Somebody who has a $5,000 deductible will not go and get these, get the care they need compared to somebody who doesn't have a deductible and has a $20 copay. And so to the extent that PPOs are unfortunately high, or tend to be reliant on high cost sharing, it's, we're still not comparing the same things. And may I just make a comment about that? Because that, that is, I have, uh, that is something that came up when we are kind of previewing this with our board. And so we are able to actually um, ask the health plans for round two if they can split out member cost sharing from the plan paid amount, so that we'll be able to kind of dig in and look at that, because I think that's a, a very real thing. We assume part of the reason you ha had round one out in public was to get comments like this. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So <laughs> I want to thank all of the panelists and ask if they could to stay as long as possible for the Q&A period. And I'm going to turn it over now to Mary Beth Shannon of uh, California Healthcare Foundation. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I also want to just thank the panel again. <laughs> Thank you. So we do have um, Yali moving with a roving microphone. And since we have people both on the phone and the web, um, we would like you to um, introduce yourself before you ask a question. But our very first two uh, questions slash comments will come from our regulatory agency. So we have Shelley Riard with the Department of Managed Healthcare with us. So Shelley, what do you think? Um, well, thank you, Mary Beth, and thank you to IHA. And uh, as a board member, I did get to a little preview of this uh, information, and really, it is quite fascinating. Um, and you know, as a regulator, I struggle with like what is the fine line between regulation and quality improver, and kind of pushing plans to do this uh, to improve the quality. Um, and through our survey process, I'm really intrigued by the differences by region in the Central Valley. Because the plans that we regulate, most of them are statewide. And they're, they're doing things in Northern California that are resulting in higher quality, and in Southern California that, for whatever reason, aren't happening in the Central Valley. And so we need to be looking at that. Like, what is it about whatever the plans are doing or not doing there that is, is making such um, a big difference? Um, another issue that struck me is the whole uh, emergency room utilization in the HMO and how high it is, and that just raises a question, is there an access problem there in some of those plans? Because like, are they going there because they can't get to a physician uh, appointment or, or the physician that they want to get, want to see, if you can't see them for some period of time? So it does raise some questions uh, and gives us an opportunity to kind of look into that a, a little bit more. So. Um, Anyway, those are just a couple of top of the head comments on this, but um, I am really anxious for my staff to kind of start digging around in this <laughs> and really looking forward to the 2015 data to see how much of a difference post-ACA uh, impacts this. So thank you. And I just want to remind everybody, in addition to using the tool online and doing the map comparisons, 
One of the things I think I love about this feature is you can download data sets. You can put it in Excel and match it up against anything else that you have, um, and it really allows for, I think, so for some richer analysis. So um, we encourage everybody to go at it. And then we have Janice Rocco from the Commissioner's Office. Um, Hi, me? I'm Janice Rocco, Deputy Commissioner at the California Department of Insurance. And um, I think this is an important initiative and uh, a fascinating one for those of us who uh, like to dig into the data and try to figure out um, what changes should be made, what actions should be taken um, as we gain more information. And I think that, I mean, I, I very much look forward to looking further at the data. So my comments are um, without having done so yet. But I would say that you know, those of us who work in this field know that cost is not an indicator of quality. Um, it's something that I don't think most consumers necessarily know yet, but this reinforces that message, and I think it, it reminds us that we need to uh, reinforce that message with large purchasers, with consumers, um, and, and so on. I think that the remarks that were made about PPOs and HMOs as we can see, we're looking at 2013 data, and not only have PPOs changed since 2013 in terms of the requirements of the ACA, but your average enrollee in an HMO may be in a plan that has much higher cost sharing than it historically did. HMOs have changed at the same time that PPOs have changed, um, both becoming more similar to one another, so that for those academics or policymakers or large purchasers or advocates who are looking at this, um, they may want to realize, think about this being a point in time and that the 2016 data will probably have some differences that would be borne out from the changes in both the PPO and the HMO products so that a large purchaser that um, feels like they must shift from one to the other, that might not be the case in 2016. We're not sure yet. Uh, so I think that that's worth knowing. And then in terms of the quality piece, what we're looking at with this particular initiative is both cost and, and quality on a regional basis. And it reminds me that with the initiative that the California Department of Insurance has been working on for the last few years, which we launched with our California Healthcare Compare website last fall, we actually do have quality data at the provider level at the hospital level that folks can look at so that you can take the quality measures relating to provider and hospital and, and use it alongside the, the data related to cost that's on the website. So um, there are some of that information already available, but I look forward to working with folks here um, and others as we look at this and think about you know what actions would be warranted as regulators or as policymakers or as advocates um, with what we can learn from the project that's going to be updated in the future. <laughs> thank you. Great. So thank you. Do we have some questions for any of the members of the panel for IJ? Actually behind you, y'all. Great. And please introduce yourself for the people who are online. Hi, I'm Suzanne Reed. I'm um, the Chief of Staff for Senator Carol Liu and consultant to the Select Committee on Aging and Long-Term Care. And um, my interest is in um, the demographic breakdowns for the clients served and how the variables are affected by um, income and age in particular. We have a particular um, interest also in hospital readmissions for um, the aging population and also um, with respect to the criteria that you're using for performance, uh, kind of what, what progress have we made in terms of using an outcomes-based uh, criteria for uh, further analysis, for example, uh, with respect to uh, breast cancer screening, uh, Mammograms are now a point of real controversy in terms of their effectiveness in uh, predicting and facilitating early uh, treatment. So um, those are basically two questions. So preventative um, criteria measures and uh, results broken down by for outcomes and within uh, specific demographic categories. 
Dolores, you up for that one? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll start and then I welcome anyone else to jump in. Um, so one of the things I didn't mention that's in the tool um, is there are some uh, demographics in there. So um, income, you know, median income and education um, are in there. Age is not. Um, and so that's something that came up before. And I think I would love to, to think about how we could get that for uh, going forward. Um, it, you can't necessarily break it down for a particular measure uh, or particular payer product type, but at least you can see for that region what it looks like. Um, and so I think that's important. Um, on the cost measure, those are adjusted for age and um, gender and all of the, the health, health conditions that a person has. So, um, so that kind of uh, is, is adjusted for in, in cost. Um, I do think, um, you know, you ask good questions about, um, you know, how do you, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure that I can address your, your second question, actually. Um, I don't so, know if you can. Yeah, let, oh, do you want to go ahead? No, the only thing I'd say, you know, some work um, we did when I was at Cover California, um, zip code is an imperfect but not completely impractical way of, of having a proxy for income. And as I think um, most of us understand, the, the claims data that drives this does have zip code information. It doesn't have specific in income information. So it's a fairly complicated path, but theoretically you could match some of these to zip code level um, and have a proxy for income level. On your second question about the measure set, um, I, I think we're all struck, and I'm now getting so old uh, thinking about this, um, with the inadequacy of the measures that we use. Um, and yes, outcomes are a, a great thing to continue forever to shoot for. I think this, if for me, is in the realm of there are so many basic problems to fix just with what we know about um, screening. And we've done some analysis internally looking at just the diabetes set, which are um, uh, a good proxy for chronic care performance. Um, but it's also a good proxy for overall quality. And it's a good proxy to some extent even for utilization in some cases. So I think I'd be more in the realm of let's work with what we have even as we aspire to more. Uh, and just to give the audience a little bit of a flavor, if this is another problem um, in all of this, if you look at across all the people that are looking for performance information, there are well over 100 going on 200 um, approved performance measures. And if you look across the major product lines in California, including Medi-Cal, Commercial, Medicare Advantage, they overlap in only one or two cases. So we have to think about not just the large integrated physician uh, providers that are trying to deal with this, but think about those PPO providers that are largely still working in smaller practices and now have to deal with CMS regulations around uh, performance set related to what's called MIPS. I won't need to get into that. So I think work with what we have to start with the, the problems that we know exist is, is probably going to be the most practical way to go at it. And I'll just um, add, so I think that um, when there are changes in um, kind of evidence or the best evidence available, um, those are things that are, you know, the evidence is, is continually updating measures as well. And we follow um, what the standard measure develop developers are doing. I mean, just recently, the whole, I mean, for years and years, we were treating cholesterol to a particular target number. And now the evidence is that that's not the best way to handle that. And so the measures that um, focused on that you know, are no longer available. So, you know, if there are changes in evidence, then, um, you know, that will be incorporated into measures going forward. And I just want to make a quick pitch for um, edition two when that is released, <laughs> um, because we are enriching the number of, of measures um, and we'll hopefully have the um, Medicare quality measures being able to break that, break that down if we have member level data to do that. So we were hoping also to have a much richer set to look at and a finer breakdown of costs for the next round. Okay, yes. And just remember to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Bill Barcelona, CAPG. Dolores, a question for you. How much of the data in this benchmark is attributable to the 7 million life uh, employer self-funded market? And how much do you anticipate that would increase in the 2015 benchmark? It's a great question, Bill. Um, so I don't have a very specific answer, um, although I know that it's not a lot. Um, 
So the way that um, the self-funded plans um, contract with their, their um, ASO health plan partners um, varies. And so some of the plans are able to provide their self-funded um, data and others are not without specific permission from each individual employer. So what we currently have is is limited. I don't have a specific number, um, but that is one of the areas that we're focusing on for expansion for round two. Yes, we've got a question here. Thank you. Um, my name is Smitha Gundavijala. I'm from UC Berkeley. Um, so, with the recent Medi-Cal expansion, um, you know, we've been talking about how Northern California has these remarkable results, at least in the pre-ACA data, but with this expansion, um, several of those counties have uh, brought managed care to rural areas. So, how do you anticipate that this tool, this really great tool, and other tools like it present an opportunity to drive and inform um, increased or improved data collection in those areas? If I could, one of the things we did, Beth Capel from Health Access again, one of the things differences that we will see in the post-ACA data is not only the expansion of Medi-Cal, but also the transformation of Medi-Cal from a largely fee-for-service program to a managed care program. So it'll be very interesting to look at Medi-Cal before and after, but also the addition of so many millions of newly insured Californians. So that will be very different as well. There's not only the rural expansion, but when you look at this Medi-Cal data, which is 2013, we have very heavy reliance on fee-for-service except for parents and children. And so there's the transition of seniors and persons with disabilities largely into managed care now. So we'll have 10, 10 million Medi-Cal managed care lives uh, that we now have. So it'll be it's, that's a big shift as well, and as we think about whether it's the Select Committee on Aging, their, their interest in seniors or people. The other population that we should be mindful of, childless adults were predominantly people ages 45 to 64. That is, they didn't have children under 18 at home. Mm -hmm. And so that's another population that's newly insured that's going to show up in the new numbers that were not in these. And I'll just um, geek out a little bit uh, on your question. Um, and that, when it comes to the data, because um, with the fee-for-service or PPO, you have claims data. Um, with uh, managed care, you have encounters, which have similar information, but it are not required for payment. And so um, sometimes there is a challenge with data completeness um, when you are relying on encounter data. Um, I know that um, DHCS has been doing a lot of work in really trying to improve the encounter data submission so that um, the data are more robust. Um, but you know, all of this measurement is limited by the data that we have. Um, and so you know, there's, there are efforts to try to make that better, um, but you know, all data are imperfect, um, and encounter data have even more challenges than claims data. But um, again, really over the years, I know on the commercial side, there's been a big effort on it. And the more it's used, the more likely it is to get better. So I know with our value-based P4P program, we found we kind of put a stake in the ground over a decade ago and said, we're not doing chart audits and all of this to try to get data. We're going to use the, the claims and encounter data. And it's gotten better. And so when you use it um, you know, and people are looking at it, that will drive improvement. Yes, we've got a question here. Hi, my name is Ethan Evans. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Davis. This is a follow-up on the Medi-Cal uh, question in relation to the geographic areas that you selected, this Cal Cover California regions. So that works well for the commercial plans and Cover California for Medi-Cal. It's not counties is a more intuitive geographic area or at or different would be the type of uh, Medi-Cal management. Uh, scheme that they use. I think there's seven of them. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you will do in the next study to improve the reporting for Medi-Cal? Let me answer that not from a technical point of view. Dolores can answer. But we can um, look at this data in a variety of different ways. Much of how we chose to look at it is limited by the voluntary participation of the people involved. So. There's no problem slicing and dicing theoretically at the zip code level or the county level or 
um, any other hospital service area level if you want to look at it that way. So uh, technically there's a lot more we can do to segment the information. Um, it's just that we've got to walk before we run. And I think to pick up on a theme that uh, Dolores is picking up, uh, um, if we use the information, there'll be a greater demand for the information and there'll be a greater sophistication in the information. This feels like we're still you know, in the 1950s, quite frankly. And what you, you can sense is we need to get this engine moving faster um, if it's going to really be useful to folks. And I would just add, I think you're right. You know, we hadn't thought about necessarily displaying it by county or something like that um, for round two. but. There are, you know, several of the covered California regions that do that are counties. Uh, actually, a lot of them are, so that there are direct mapping sometimes. And I think you bring up a good point about the management systems. And I, I think that um, there's a whole, you know, another another whole level of um, kind of analysis and and really trying to understand. I mean, I kind of gave you a high level descriptive, um, you know. Uh, view of the results, but you know, not trying to really understand well. So, for the the copy, county operated health systems, what do those kind of uh, regions look like? Um, are there differences when you take that kind of management system into perspective? So, I think that there's a whole different level of analysis that could could happen, and this is just kind of scratching the surface. So, I think that's a great point. Yeah, and let me just reiterate something that Jeff said that, that because this was a voluntary data submission from the various plans, um, we did make some agreements about the level of aggregation we would go to. Um, it would be, the data's all been collected at a more detailed level than that. It's sitting in Truven at a more detailed level than that. But there's a restriction on how far we can go, how far this project can go to doing it. Um, but, you know, if there is an outcry, perhaps the plans would be interested in res limiting some of those restrictions. So I encourage you right to your plans. Um, okay, do we have another question? Ah, yes, in the back. Hi, this is a, a wonderful study. I'm Albert Loeyball from UC Berkeley School of Public Health. I was just wondering whether uh, measures of uh, hospital concentration and or health plan concentration could be included in the overall uh, project and also whether measures of uh, which uh, uh, some state agencies, including DMHC, are, uh, already have uh, on access to independent practice associations or provider medical groups, whether those measures could be used. Thank you. Uh, very good question. Um, I know that there um, are a couple of different pieces of work happening on looking at um, concentration. Um, we had not talked about bringing that in. And, you know, again, this is really more about geographic. Um, level and not specific providers or specific health plans, but I do think that you know that that could be something. I mean, I could certainly look into that um, and see how that might uh, come in and be used. Um, that kind of next level of understanding. Yeah. I'm seeing no other questions at this point. Mary Beth, are there any questions from people? No, we, yeah, we don't have the capability. Thanks for offering that. I'm Maybe trying. next time. We'll I don't do want to forget that. Um, I just want to mention again what Sandra had mentioned earlier, that we do use these evaluations to both help uh, inform the work that we're doing, um, as well as, as get a sense of what you're really interested in. This one is two-sided. On one side, we're actually asking for some feedback about the project itself, and then the other side about the format of the briefings that we can use to help inform future work. So uh, in light of that, if you fill that out and hand them to people on the way out, I think we're covered. Let me just thank one more time, our fine panel, and, our, uh, and the excellent partnership that the three organizations have had. Um, you know, we're still speaking to each other two years later, and we've got another year of work to go, so it's great. Thank you very much. <laughs>